Uh, hi, my name is uh, Tryggvi Larsson and uh, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Green Cloud. So I'm going to talk about today uh, the future of the cloud and uh, I like emerging technologies like uh, containers <coughs> are uh, changing the way we deploy and, and package applications today. And uh, how this is like leading towards a convergence of uh, traditional uh, IT workloads like HPC and, and big data and with uh, the broader trend of cloud computing. So just to give a little context and I uh, want to uh, explain briefly what we do at Green Cloud. So our main product is called QStack. Uh, th and this is a cloud management uh, solution, cloud uh, management stack for, for managing and uh, setting up a uh, private, uh, public and, and hybrid cloud uh, <coughs> projects. And uh, here we see a screenshot of, of the system. It can be set up to manage both virtual machines, traditional uh, cloud uh, virtual machine instances, as well as bare metal and so on. And I'm going to show a little bit of that uh, in a demo later on. So the main uh, topic of this talk is to talk about how we can very easily uh, and in a standard way package applications so that uh, whoever who knows the standard uh, knows how to run your application and, uh, and it needs to be a very uh, simple and, and standard way. So I suspect that this is a very common problem among IT deployments all the way from uh, uh, development of, of applications all the way down to system administration and, and deployment. So the, the common pain points in deploying your application, and I guess this is something that many at least who are system administrators or application developers are quite uh, aware of and, and have, have had uh, first-hand experience with, is that when you deploy your application, uh, you're always having problem with the dependencies. Your application depends on libraries, depends on things that are running in the environment. So, so this is a traditional uh, and, and a common problem. Whether you deploy your application in, in a cloud environment, a HPC supercomputer, a uh, local uh, environment, and so on. And even though you may have, for instance, the same OS, uh, let's say Linux, you may have different variants of Linux. You may have Debian or Ubuntu. Uh, or Red Hat or, or SUSE based uh, Linux distributions all having incompatible packaging systems and, and then you have different network topologies, you have maybe different interconnects, you have different ways of handling the network, you have several different versions of libraries usually depending on your uh, setup and very Traditionally, or very commonly in, in HPC style environments, you have compilers and things like that that your application may depend on. So, so how do we really solve these problems? So I want to present one solution to this problem that's uh, called Docker. And uh, in companion to that, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Core OS. So Docker uh, is a container system, I guess, uh, many here, or at least some are familiar with Docker, it's quite quite common uh, in the at least cloud computing circles today to, to be experimenting with that. It's a, both Docker and CoreOS are very new and recent uh, projects, uh, less than one or two years old. So Docker is about two years old or, or barely that. Uh, but CoreOS is one way of running Docker. So you can of course run Docker on, on any uh, Linux distribution, modern Linux distribution, as long as you have a uh, fairly recent kernel. I think it's about uh, from version 3.8 and upwards. I'm going to talk about a little bit about Docker. Uh, so it's standard runtime uh, on top of Linux. It just needs pretty much the, the bare bones Linux kernel. And uh, it has, defines uh, standard container or image, binary image format. So you can build your container and into a binary and then ship it somewhere and you can move it around. So uh, it's a quite, quite convenient way of moving your applications. 
And uh, thirdly, it has a Docker has a centralized repository. <coughs> so this is a little bit similar, like many are familiar with GitHub. So this is a bit like GitHub, what GitHub is for code, except for runtimes so or for actual package applications. So the uh, Docker Hub has something, I uh, think, about close to 100,000 ready-made images. Uh, and about Core OS, uh, it's a very minimal uh, distribution, it's a very minimal Linux distribution. It's quite convenient to use that to run Docker. But like I said, it, uh, Docker doesn't depend on this, uh, this variant of Linux. But uh, you could say that Core OS is a little bit back to the basics of the traditional Unix way of doing things. That is, to do one thing and to do one thing well. So the, the Core OS just pretty much has only the Linux kernel and a few uh, basic utilities, a few basic Unix utilities that those who manage Unix systems know very well. Uh, and then, in addition to this, uh, CoreOS standardizes on systemd for, for launching services. It uh, has uh, introduces new things like uh, etcd. Uh, and etcd is uh, just a very uh, simple way of clustering your host together. Uh, it's pretty much a key value store. It's just like uh, a database, you could say except if it has built-in consensus algorithms. So, so it can handle things like master election and things like that. And it's, it's extremely simple to use. That's one of the main advantages. Uh, it has just a REST API and very simple Unix command line utilities. So you can, in just a few lines of a script, uh, automatically cluster your application. So that is one of the advantages. Uh, uh, Fleet builds on ECD, so you can. Fleet is a little bit like systemd, except for on a cluster wide level. And uh, in addition to this, uh, Coros introduces overlay network like uh, Flannel, which uh, enables you to, to uh, have a very uh, simple way of uh, configuring a, a network that your host talks together. Uh, and Docker, of course, so. Core OS 4 goes the, the traditional way of running uh, Linux distributions, that is, doesn't have a, doesn't have a package manager. So, uh, so it, did, it relies on Docker for installing applications. And uh, it's quite interesting that a lot of these developments that have been happening in this space, in the container space and, and the cloud, have been inspired by Google. And people behind Core OS have really been uh, having no secret around that. that uh, some of the, the projects they have been introducing and the, the, uh, the philosophy is highly inspired by how Google has been running their infrastructure uh, for at least part of the past 10 years. Uh, Google has, of course, a vast infrastructure and they deploy all their things in containers and, and have a job management queuing system called, it used to be called Borg, and I think it's called Omega now. So the advantages of Docker is the very, very simple packaging. Um, mm -hmm. and it has thousands of ready-made images, has quite low overhead if you compare to uh, traditional virtual machine-based deployments uh, because it doesn't have the burden of the hypervisor. Uh, it's very portable, so you can just package your application, move it around quite easily. Uh, one thing that maybe Docker uh, takes us a one step closer is like this this pipe dream of, of building your application from from ready-made components like Lego blocks. So, so it's quite easy to because of the standard runtime it's quite easy to start up a few containers, wire them together, and then you have an application that is like a a whole of several components without really having to do very much. <coughs> So the Docker file, this is a very simple Docker file, how you can just uh, build on, on a ready-made image. So in this case, I'm building on the Ubuntu 14.04 image from the central Docker Hub. I'm just uh, showing how to, how to very simply package MySQL as container. And you just install the MySQL server with, with uh, the package manager, and then you define what uh, service you want to run when the container starts. And then finally, you use this Docker file and run the command 
there below. Uh, Docker build command and just tag it with a name, MySQL, and then you have built your container. And then to run it, it's quite simple as well. It's just uh, the docker run command, and then you just type in a few parameters. And if you want to run it in the background and so on, you type in how you want to map the ports, uh, and then the name of the container, and you're ready to go. Yeah. So it's, you can, in most, <coughs> in most cases, just start up a container with one, one line command. Uh, and so how, and, and where is this really uh, leading us? On a broader scale, then I want to look at uh, how the cloud is today. And if we uh, look closely, then the cloud is dominated really, the cloud market today, by several very big players. So, uh, like Amazon Web Services is by far the, the biggest player in the market. And this is like their locations around the globe. Uh, so, you can see that it's, that it's quite heavily uh, centralized around. <coughs> A few key locations. So, so this shows us how the cloud has, at least to date, been centralizing workloads to several very big data centers. Uh, but I think that uh, shift that's going to be a shift towards uh, a little bit back towards decentralization. So, if we take a look back in history, and then the whole development of computing started with the mainframes back in the 1960s. And then you had the introduction of the PCs in the 1980s and the 1990s. Uh, and the mainframes were, of course, highly centralized. And then you started to decentralize the application with, uh, with the workstation, the desktop PCs. And then you started to centralize the workloads back again because they were getting web-based. Um, and so in 2000s, uh, and 2010s, we saw the emergence of the cloud, and then started to centralize the locate the the workloads back again. But uh, what I'm going to make a case for is that you, we're going to see at least a little bit of, of decentralization back again because of the, the container concept and how easy it really is to move <laughs> workloads. So you're not as dependent on the big uh, cloud vendors uh, as you were before. So the clouds of tomorrow will be more decentralized, I think. It will make more sense to run at least smaller scale cloud operations and, and specialized cloud operations running uh, towards several different workloads. So it doesn't have to be on this vast uh, web scale like the, uh, some of the big players are aiming, at, aiming on. Uh, so one of the I've talked about CoreOS and, and Docker and some of the other technologies that are emerging that are quite interesting. It's like uh, Kubernetes is one of them, which is a project from Google. Uh, Mesos is another one that's, uh, uh, that's actually originally from Twitter. And, uh, and Hadoop. And I'm going to show uh, now a demo of how, how we can very easily uh, package together uh, a container uh, running Hadoop or HDFS, uh, more specifically of Hadoop, uh, and run that in a container and how can we how can really do that in pretty much just one click. Switch the screen here. <coughs> Okay, uh, I'm going to de demo this through our QStack uh, environment, or through uh, one of our main uh, partners, Advania. Uh, so this is a hosted uh, cloud, public cloud by Advania, uh, back in Iceland, and I'm showing here. Uh, so let us log in here. So here I have my, my dashboard and my, my list of instances, my, my virtual machines in this case running. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a new cluster. I'm going to call it uh, Hadoop HDFS cluster. Dollar sign for, for like an incremented number. Of, I'm going to start with three machines. 
and I'm gonna select uh, core OS. I'm gonna use core OS as a base. Uh, this could be really any other uh, Linux distribution. Uh, so I'm gonna select an 8 gig size machine. And uh, because the core OS template that I'm selecting is generic, it doesn't really do anything when I start it up. I have to tell the cluster what to do. So that is what I'm going to paste in here into, into the user data field, which is going to like <coughs> paste in instructions for the cluster what to do when it starts up. So uh, I'm going to use, uh, and this is the most common way of using core OS. It's called, called, I don't know if you see this well, I can maybe enlarge this a bit. So this is cloud config. It starts with this sign. What I'm, uh, what I could do as well is I could paste in a, a bash script or or something like that. Just would start with a, a hash mark uh, in bash. And this is just describing the cluster that I'm starting up. It has like starts up etcd, which is the cluster manager, and it uh, tells it a cluster identifier. And so this is just, if you are familiar with systemd, this is just defining really systemd uh, units, that, that is services to start up. And this maybe looks a little bit complicated if you don't know it, but it's actually quite easy to learn once you get the hang of it. Uh, so it starts uh, up some services, like in this case we're going to start up Flannel as well, which is like the overlay network. So uh, this, this cluster that I'm starting up could actually span several data centers if I would want. But uh, here in this case, we define like a, a network, a slash 16 network. I'm going to use that to share the network between all the hosts. And what Flannel does very conveniently is that it uh, segments and slices up the uh, network to slash 24 networks per host. So each host actually that I'm starting up in the cluster gets its own fragment of the network. But everything is routed together. Uh, and then after this, I'm going to start up uh, Docker itself and then a container uh, uh, running Hadoop HDFS. So you can see the commands here, docker pull, the docker tag, and docker run. It's really, uh, so I'm gonna take this here, paste it in. Yeah. So I could actually start this up about a bare metal cluster, uh, a cluster of bare metal machine. It would make no difference, it's the same workflow. So now it's going to take just a few seconds to start up the machines. Now they're starting up. So see here, Hadoop HDFS cluster 1, 2, and 3. So new machines. We can go here in and uh, see the console window of the machine. And uh, the machine should be up. So here, see the console prompt. It's quite fast to boot up. So if I go back here, I can SSH into the instance. To my new machine here, I have a public IP address. Because of the cloud config, I pasted in my SSH key, so I actually can just log in with the password. So I don't know if you see this well. Okay. I have this old IP address in my known host here. <coughs> So, like this. So now you can see the process list. I can see it's running up. It's been up for one minute. Uh, I see in the process list here it's running Docker pool. So it's pulling actually the Hadoop HDFS container here from our central registry. So uh, it's doing the work. So this is going to take just maybe uh, one, two minutes. Okay, so it's already on. So Docker PS, so this shows that the <coughs> container we started 40 seconds ago. And so this is the Hadoop cluster should be starting up and configuring itself. So what we did in this actually as well is that because Hadoop and HDFS depends on that one of the nodes is a master node, so it needs to coordinate the system. So in this script we did automatic master election. So the 
I didn't know actually what, which one of the machines would be the master, but the cluster itself elected who would, would be master and then joined automatically the other two nodes to be slaves of that master. So I have another script here that's called uh, GFS cluster master and then I So this is just a very small script uh, that takes in the IP address of any of the machines in the cluster and then SSH into the machine and then into the container running inside the Corehouse machine. So here I'm in the, in the container, I have a PS here, I see, that I see only the processes running inside this container. And, uh, if I do like HDFS, DFS admin, minus report, then I should see the, the cluster status. <coughs> uh, taking a while here. Okay. okay, let's do it again. Alright, so we see that we have three nodes here, three live data nodes. And you see app time here, so this is about <coughs> three minutes. So it's just been started three minutes. You have a ready-made HDFS cluster. Uh, don't have to do anything except just uh, define the cloud config to initialize the cluster. So it's, so this is just showing the power of Docker and the and the uh, ease of how you can really just build up clusters in one one click and automate it, and don't have to spend uh, like weeks on configuring cluster. So I'm going to show as well a little demo of the how you can uh, start a doctor cluster. That is, uh, you can start three machines and let them behave like one big Docker host. And you can have the same than, let's say, if you want to run 100 hosts. And they could just very easily uh, spin up Docker containers and then it just automatically would, it would spin up on some of the, some of the hosts behind the scenes. Uh, so this is, this is a... Mm -hmm project called uh, Docker Swarm. So I'm going to paste in another cloud config here. It's just a little bit simpler. Uh, it just pretty much starts up Docker and starts up, uh, starts up Swarm, the Swarm management system. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to create a new cluster, call it just Docker Swarm cluster, dollar sign, and then three machines. I'm going to select uh, OrOS as well, and yeah, this is a virtual machine, and then I'm going to select just 8 gig uh, memory machines, and I'm going to paste in the, the cloud config I had before. Right. Yeah. Just a few seconds. So all of this can be done with the API as well. So in the system, it's actually doing EC2 compatible, that is Amazon Web Services compatible API calls here behind the scenes. So I could actually run a command line tool to totally automate this process. So I could just run EC2 run instances, type in a user data script, and then I could just every hour start up cluster of machines on demand automatically. Uh, so this, where is this? New cluster here, here it is. Docker Swarm cluster one, so I see here. So here I see that it's a console prompt. This is gonna take a few minutes to start up, so even though it's very short to start up, I don't really have time to wait for it, so I, I'm gonna just use an existing cluster I have here. So I did start up yesterday, a Swarm cluster here, so these machines here. So I'm going to use this to demo how this works. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So now I have set the environment where I will Docker host, so I can <coughs> see that this IP address here, look closely, uh, it's the same IP address as the, this, this machine here. So I'm, I'm going to talk to this cluster. So if I do Docker PS, then I see the process is running on it. And here in this case, it's just running the management system itself. It's really not running any process at all. So I'm going to start up just, say I'm going to start up 100 containers. And just for simplicity, I'm going to start up just a for loop. 
uh, just run up containers and do a sleep for 20 seconds. So, do. so, so you can see that uh, these containers here have different hosts. So these are, these are the, the islands here, to look closely, are the same as you can see here in the list. So, so these, these are three machines. Or ID and just a small loop here. Docker run, minus D, demonize it, um, then run Debian, just Debian 7, and run bin sleep for, yeah, 25 seconds. Right, so now starting up here, you can see the clusters, the, the containers, then on another screen we can maybe do watch <coughs> Docker PS, you see the containers being started up here. So you can see that they are being started up on different, if you look at the I names there, you can see that they're being started up on three different hosts. So just out of the box, I'm just getting a cluster here and just managing, uh, starting up processes in a very sim simple manner if you have uh, packaged your application in a Docker container. Now we see the machines and then they should be shutting down as well in a few, few seconds because they just live for 25 seconds. <coughs> and then I can go into just show you, I'm just going to one of the machines here as well. Uh, just SSH or, or at, and then uh, log into the machine itself and do Docker PS, and then I can see that it's running some of the, some of the containers, but not all of them. So they're just uh, one, one third of the containers running on this host. All right. Um, compare the Docker to, to and containers in general to uh, traditional virtual machines, then one of the advantages of is, uh, of course, it has lower overhead because it, it doesn't have to carry the burden of the hypervisor layer, doesn't have to virtualize the entire stack of the operating system, so it just is pretty much just a process. So the container is just a process within the uh, outer operating system, so it's very cheap to start up and has very little overhead and very little memory overhead. Um, there have been made some studies on comparing Docker to, to traditional virtual uh, solutions like KVM. Uh, so this is one study that I'm quoting here from IBM. It's uh, comparing uh, performance on Docker versus KVM versus just native bare metal performance. And you can see that it quite depends on the, the workload that you're running, uh, how much overhead you're getting from the virtualization. Uh, so in, for a lint pack, for instance, you can see that it's like uh, almost 50% overhead, but, um, but of course Docker has no overhead at all, virtually, uh, because it's just a process, it's just uh, very lightweight. And um, the reason why lint pack, for instance, is much slower in KVM is because of the memory management, the uh, NUMA-based access that it, it uh, has to, to get to the processors to, to share memory. Uh, so that KVM virtualizes the CPU to, which makes this a little bit more trickier. Uh, in other benchmarks, like the stream benchmark, which is just doing memory bandwidth testing, uh, there's really very little <coughs> internet in KVM virtualization. So it, it, it very much depends on the, your kind of workload. Uh, so uh, companies or organizations, VMware cluster or or on bare metal machines and, and select very different uh, Linux operating systems. The only thing that you have to have is to have a fairly recent Linux kernel and then your application, your Docker application just runs, uh, just if you have packaged it once. <coughs> so the uh, implications of this whole trend to, uh, for the, the HPC, the typical HPC and, and developer and, and administrator is, I think it ha will have several consequences. Uh, 
of course, firstly, that you have more, more flexibility, you have more choice, you, you can uh, deploy your application on, on very different scenarios, but still have your application very easily deployable and have to tweak it to run on, on, on different environments. Uh, and then the sheer speed of deployment is a, a very crucial factor because you can, if you have packaged your application in a, in a container, a Docker container, then you can very easily run it up. And, and you can also then spur new innovation and collaboration because you can build upon the work of others and you can use the ready-made containers that are out there, build upon them, improve them, and you can uh, share containers and, and let other people uh, uh, collaborate and, and make improvements. So I think it's going to uh, spur a whole new uh, way <coughs> of innovation. Thank you very much. That was it.